All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, for the next 12 minutes or so, I am going to uh, give an overview on some updates and some recent and emerging issues that we've been dealing with, uh, with insects uh, in the landscape. So golf courses and landscape. Um, and so I'm going to touch on four main things. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about some recent chinch bug issues, touch on total mealy bugs, which has been a relevant thing for a lot of people recently, touch on Bermuda grass, which has been an emerging issue on golf courses, and then talk about some recent progress we've been making on uh, the lawn side. So first, chinch bugs, everybody's very familiar with chinch bugs. Here in Florida, we have the southern chinch bug. This thing is a sap feeding pest. Pretty rapidly can wipe out your lawn. I learned that really quickly when I moved to Florida, uh, as you can see in these photos on the top right. Um, but these things go through incomplete metamorphosis. So they are a mix of nymphs and adults developing and reproducing in that same lawn. Um, and you can get pretty rapid decline and dieback. Uh, so something that we've been seeing this year and a little bit last year is more and more instances where chinch bugs are damaging Bermuda grass or zoysia grass. Uh, typically when you think of chinch bugs, you think of St. Augustine grass. But the reality of the situation is these things don't only feed on St. Augustine grass. So I think it's important to be aware that they show up in other turf species. And if you're managing zoysia lawns or Bermuda grass, uh, don't count out chinch bugs for being a pest. Um, so this table here and this article in Pest Pro Magazine that came out this past month um, discussed this in more detail. But basically, there's a spectrum of susceptibility to chinch bugs. St. Augustine grass is at the top. Centipede grass is the least susceptible, a non-host, but there's a spectrum here where these other turf species fall in. So keep that in mind and don't be too caught off guard if you have chinch bugs damaging zoysia or Bermuda grass. You manage them the same way um, and the risks are still there. They tend to be able to handle damage a little better because they do have rhizomes and can recover a little more regularly, uh, but don't forget chinch bugs reproduce really quickly. They like it hot and dry. They like more nitrogen, so be careful with fertilization. And they like a lot of thatch. So be on top of the cultural practices and rotate insecticides because there are cases of insecticide resistance with chinch bugs. So use as many chemical classes as you can and aim for having three in sequence. The next pest I'm going to talk about is one that is associated with this kind of damage. Uh, this is a an empire or two empire zoysia lawns. Uh, this is not my backyard, but this is uh, property in the Palm Beach area. Um, this is associated with total mealy bug, which I know many folks have been dealing with around the state, especially this time of year. Um, these are mealy bugs like you would find on an ornamental plant except they feed on grass. Uh, so they're sap feeding pests like other mealy bugs, like chinch bugs, uh, but they primarily attack zoysia grass and I've occasionally found them in Bermuda grass. So look for that gray brown dieback like you saw in the previous image and look for this white waxy residue at the base of these leaves and little pink mealy bugs hiding in that wax. Um, this time of year is when you're going to see the biggest flare-ups and the worst damage. Well, a little earlier than this. So typically late summer um, is when we see the worst damage. So keep an eye out for that damage. Um, and really think about an integrated approach to managing these pests. Because if you think about the different ways we can intervene to control pests, cultural practices, biological control, chemical control. You really want to use as much of this as possible. And it it really comes down to cultural practices, especially in these zoysia grass lawns. Um, so make sure you're managing the lawn properly. If you don't manage the lawn, make sure somebody is, uh, because thatch seems to be the common denominator here when we're dealing with total mealybug outbreaks. Um, 
if the patch is not managed and dealt with, you're going to have more frequent outbreaks, more severe damage, and a lot more difficulty getting control of these pests. So in addition to cultural management of the turf, um, there's some other really important things to think about. You want to rotate your insecticide classes, just like for chinch bugs. These things develop the same way as chinch bugs and are in that turf hiding in all the little nooks and crannies. So resistance is a real risk. It's not been documented, but it is a real risk. The other thing you want to make sure you do is that you don't make repeat broad spectrum insecticide applications to these lawns. Um, because what that's doing is it's controlling everything living in that turf, the good and bad bugs. And if you make repeat applications of that, especially at short time intervals, you're going to be basically cleaning, cleaning out that turf and allowing the mealybugs that survive, because some are going to survive, they're now able to feed and reproduce without any kind of predators or parasites attacking them. So don't make repeat broad spectrum insecticide applications. And that's things like pyrethroids. And then the last point I want to make on this pest is you've really got to remember that the damage lags behind the infestation. So even if you get control of these pests, you're not going to see the turf recover immediately. So be sure to go out, scout for the pest, make sure it's there and alive before you make another insecticide application because you may have controlled the pest and now the turf just needs time to recover. And this time of year when we're seeing the most damage, you may not see full recovery until the spring. So you got to be patient and you got to convince your clients to be patient. The third pest I'm going to talk about is something that is associated with this type of damage, primarily on golf courses. Uh, but I have seen instances in landscapes and other places like cemeteries. Uh, this is the Bermuda grass mite. So this is a little very, very small banana shaped mite that gets in Bermuda grass and causes this witch's brooming damage um, that can really twist up and mangle turf and create a really thin stand of grass, which is a real problem when it happens on a golf course fairway. Um, so things to keep in mind, they're called Bermuda grass mite for a reason. These are very specialized mites, so they only feed on Bermuda grass. Um, and this just shows the progression of that damage uh, from a healthy shoot to a very messed up and mangled and eventually dead shoot. Uh, in collaboration with Dr. Unruh and his graduate student, Augustine, we uh, put out, sent out a survey about this pest um, last year and a little bit in this year. And we had almost 120 people respond to that, 85% of which have dealt with Bermuda grass mite on their courses. Um, and they see it all the times a year in Florida. But we do see these two peaks where we have a peak in March and we have a peak in October. The March peak is typically most severe, and that is the one that you want to deal with if you're trying to manage this pest. When you think about where they're causing problems on the course, uh, respondents to our survey reported these figures. So most of our cases are on roughs and fairways. We don't have any instances on the greens and a very small number on tees. And a lot of that probably has to do with the height of cut. So think about the damage these, these mites cause. If they've only got a little bit of turf to work with, they're not going to be able to cause that damage and feed and reproduce. So they're going to be in the taller turf. We typically see most cases on celebration Bermuda grass, but a lot of people also reported it on, on Tifway. Um, and then some several instances in common. But celebration is typically where we try to find cases because they have the best symptoms on the research side. Have you, try, have you tried to control these things with uh, insecticides? Most people have, but only about half found them to be effective. So this just points out that these things are really difficult to control with insecticides, especially with the tools that we have currently available. So things to keep in mind, uh, based on the research that we've done at UF and research that my colleague at Clemson is working on, we know that drought stress is associated with Bermuda grass mite damage. So more drought is more problematic. Uh, we know if you can target the late winter 
populations in Florida, you're going to get the best control. So that's when you want to be trying to reduce these pests. We know if you can scalp and collect the clippings, that does remove a substantial amount of the population and then you get reduction. That, that damage comes back the next year, but it does make a difference. And then spot treating the areas that are symptomatic can, can also help, but it, the results vary. Um, and abamectin is currently our hands down the best option for controlling this pest. Um, and we have found that the, uh, six ounces per acre at a two week interval is the best rate um, and frequency and make sure you include a surfactant with that. Uh, these are two resources available. Um, so I encourage you to check those out. And then in my last minute, I'm going to touch on a project we've been working on mixing cultivars of St. Augustine grass that I'm sure many of you have heard about. And if you came to the field days in the past couple of years, you've seen. Uh, we're seeing evidence of benefits associated with mixing cultivars on insect pests like caterpillar pests. And we're continuing to look into other pests like the chinch bug. Um, the other thing we've been looking at is how it actually affects the planting. And so we've done several studies where we're taking images and quantifying different metrics of the plant community. Uh, but we now have 47 months of aerial photos and we're starting to see some real separation in the coverage of turf grass within these plots. And I'm sure you can tell from the 11 month photo to the 47 month photo that some plots don't look so hot anymore. Um, so to give you a better illustration of that, 47 months after planting, this is kind of how things have played out among our different treatments where we have cultivar monocultures, a mixture of two cultivars and a mixture of four cultivars. And I think it's pretty apparent by looking at this that mixing cultivars increases that plot's ability to maintain some turf grass coverage. And so we're digging a little deeper into this and hoping to get some of this information out in the near future. If you came to a field day in 2017 or 2019, you participated in a survey and these are the results of that where ultimately we don't see a reduction in turf quality, uh, perceived turf quality uh, by mixing cultivars together. So that's encouraging. And next you'll hear a little more about what we're doing with this study system from my student James Pigney and then Katie Carroll, another student, will be talking about the next steps and other projects we have going on.